Bourne for hip hop and R and B. This is the B to C team. My name is Jenny Boom Boom. DJ Michi is here with me. Hello there, Michi. Good morning. Today we have Superintendent of Hartford Public Schools, Dr. Leslie Torres Rodriguez. How are you? I am doing okay. Taking it one day at a time. Yeah, I, I have to say, first and foremost, because I do have children in public schools, and I have to say I applaud everyone in the public school system because, wow, you guys have dealt with a lot this year um, with all of the changes. So how are things going You know, right now with Hartford Public Schools? You know, we are trying to do the best that we can um, for all of our students, for our families, for our staff. And so... We have to think about early on when we started to plan for the unpredictable, the uncertain, um, and the impact of the pandemic, we had a commitment. We made a commitment to our families that we would offer in-person learning to the extent that it was safe to do so. And so we've been able to maintain that commitment. Currently where we are, we have shifted to a hybrid uh, learning model. And so students are in school um, you know, two days a week until the external health conditions um, allow us to increase the number of, of in-person days. Okay. So like in my school system, we have like cohort A, B, and C, and A and B are switching off and going to school. And then C, they stay home. My kids are staying home currently. Um, are you doing something similar to that? We have, um, so about 18,000 students is our total student population and about 10,000 of those students are already fully remote, right? So those are the students that do not come to us whose parents have elected to be home and learn remotely. The remaining, you know, 7,800 students are on that hybrid model where they are cohorted, as you said, and we have our A cohort and a B cohort and um, Wednesday is a, a remote day for everyone, um, including our teachers. Hmm. So, you know, do you see things, you know, working well so far? I mean, it is, it is a challenge. And, um, you know, for some students, it is a blessing. We hear um, students that are saying this is the best thing that has happened because they need the flexibility. Um, but we know that for the majority of our students, you know, and, our, and, and I say this because our, our numbers are, are confirming it. The remote instruction is just not working. Um, we see that attendance. Um, is lower for students that learn remotely. We see that the engagement, we see the grades, we see the submission of completed assignments, all of those uh, metrics, if you will, those points are lower for students that are learning remotely. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's a flag for us because um, before COVID, we in Hartford Public Schools, one thing we do not do is shy away from the challenges that we have. One of the challenges we had was, and continue to have, was chronic absenteeism, right? When a student misses 10% or more of the of school days. And so we, we came into COVID with that and we had made great strides. And now we see that our absenteeism rate has doubled across all of our schools, even the schools that last year, right? Had very, very um, small, difficulty, you know, small challenge with chronic absenteeism. So, um, you know, it is, it is, um, it has exacerbated um, the challenges, the challenges that we had co coming into COVID. Um, but we know that for other students right there, they're, they're fully on. Um, and we also know that their, their support, their network system, right, looks very different for, um, than it does for some of our other students that are living in high, um, either high poverty or high need communities. Now, in your opinion, um, you know, what, what do you think the challenges are that these kids are facing? Is it just like the in-person interaction or? It's, it's a variety. What we've, what we've learned, um, what we learned in the spring and what we're learning now, given that we just received our, our survey back from students, families, and staff, uh, students miss their peers. Right. Students miss. The, I mean, we are first of all, we're human beings. And second, you know, we have to think about the developmental process and progress of students. Right. When we look at the grades that have the highest number uh, or percentage of absenteeism is our middle schoolers. And the middle schoolers were the group that was um, that had the best attendance, for example, pre-COVID. 
And when you think about what that means developmentally, you're in your your preteen, right? And so you're trying to figure things out. Your peer group is probably the most important experience, right? As you are developing as a person and as a learner. And so that's one challenge. The other challenge is all the needs that are that some of our families have, right? Our some of our families just cannot, um, you know, carve space and time during the day to support their learner. Um, their child during the remote instruction because they have to go to work because right they have other siblings at home because they are in a multi-generational home and they have to tend for others in their family right so you have what I call um, this like collision of um, challenges that um, face our families and and by extension the learning that our students are experiencing now right Wow. I, I have to say, everything you just said to us really surprised me, you know, because especially with the attendance, I would feel like it's easier than ever to get your kids onto the computer to attend school. What I do understand is the carving out the workspace. I absolutely understand, you know, even in my situation, I have a fourth grader here. I have no idea how to do fractions anymore. And he keeps asking me how to do fractions and I don't know, but I do have my older daughter here to help out. Thank God, you know, so, you know, right, what we're doing right now seems to be working. Is it very challenging? It's extremely challenging. So everything you just threw in the mix there. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense that these kids are really struggling. The kids are struggling and their families, right, are struggling. And, um, you know, we we have to make sure that we provide our meals to our students, right? I'm now thinking about, okay, team, did we have, um, you know, did we double the meal supply tomorrow that's going out because we have a snowstorm coming, right? And we're in cohorts and we need to make sure that the kids that were coming to school just Monday and Tuesday in that cohort have the meals that they're going to need, not only for the snow day, but throughout the weekend, Right. So these are all of the things, Jenny and, and DJ Michi, that we have to we have to solve for on top of supporting our teachers to to so that they can feel, um, you know, that they're they have the knowledge, the skill and the disposition. Right. To do the unthinkable, which is on one day I'm going to do remote because I'm in quarantine or my class has been quarantined. And the next day I'm going to, you know, be in person. Oh, and the next day I'm going to probably have to do it tandem because half of my kids are here and half are home, right? This is, this is, you know, a lot that we are asking of everyone. And I am, I am in, in, in admiration, continuous admiration of what our staff, our teachers um, are able to do every single day. So Dr. Torres Rodriguez, I know in my situation, I'm receiving emails daily for the school system where I live saying that there are positive COVID-19 cases and you brought this up, you know, teachers have to quarantine. I know even with my, you know, son's class, he sees his teacher home one day with all the students and they're back in quarantine again, you know? Um, so that must be extremely challenging too. I mean, that's gotta be crazy because you have to, you know, trace every single person that this person came in, in contact with uh, every time there's a positive case, correct? That is um, challenging and it is, it is, it's, 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 it's continuous, right? It's like this cycle and circle that we continue uh, to go through. The, the one thing that I will tell you that we did early on in the summer was we tried to prepare for it. So we said, um, you know, we're going to hire a, a contact tracing nurse. So this is on top of all this, the nurses that we have, we have one person specifically dedicated to, to do contact tracing and is going to partner with um, the health director, for example, the local health director. We now have two nurses. We have to hire a second nurse, right, to just make sure that um, to the extent possible, we do the tracing as fast as we can so that we can isolate quickly, quarantine quickly, and then get back right, to, to work, if you will, um, uh, to instruction, to delivery of the program as fast as we can. But what we have seen now that we shifted to hybrid is um, a, a quick decrease in the number of cases. First of all, the majority of our cases are um, outside of school. Uh, if we look across our numbers, 10% of our cases have happened in school. 90% of them are outside. Are from because of like social interaction, correct? And family, right, outside of school. And so, um, you know, that has implications too, right? That means that what we're doing internally with our mitigations, it's working. 
Right. So kudos to all the staff, because that was a lot. There were a lot of pain points at the beginning. Why are we doing all these mitigations? This is why, right? Mm -hmm. Because in the long run, right, if we stay true to our safety mitigations, we'll be able to, right, keep more kids in. Um, we now have uh, no more than 30% of our students in school. That means that that's it. No more than 14 students in a classroom in person. And the average number of students in a classroom across the district is nine. So there is ample opportunity to have that six feet of distancing while keeping your mask on, disinfecting and doing all the other mitigations. Hmm. So have, you know, teachers, have they come to you and, and, you know, said it all that they feel really worried about teaching? Absolutely. I have, I have um, heard it, seen it, um, read it, uh, felt it. You know, when I, I visit classrooms, I visit schools, I make it a point to visit every week. Um, and, um, and I see it and I feel it and they're trying. And, um, that's, that's one of the biggest challenges, uh, Jenny it, it is balancing the need to support our staff and make them whole while doing that for the families who I also get the phone calls and the emails and who stop me at, you know, sea town when I go buy, you know, my root vegetables, um, and, and in tears say to me, I'm going to lose my job again. And I'm going to be homeless again. If my kid does my four, five kids, right, whatever, don't go, can't go to school every day. Right. So the, it, those are real challenges impacting. Oh, and my teacher saying, oh, and my district just closed. My district just went remote. And, and I'm saying, I, yes, and I don't have any more remote, you know, learning um, assignments. Right. It's 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 an everyday push and pull. Hmm. I, I can only imagine, you know, that's just it's awful. Um, but, you know, you did mention uh, the remote thing. And I just want to confirm with you, um, Dr. Torres Rodriguez, that these kids will never have a snow day again, will they? So I, we, we planned so that they don't have a snow day and we're remote. We sent all of that communication home. Here's, I'm going to tell you right now, and, and this is probably going to go public. So <laughs> people are going to probably hold me, hold me to that. So I'm looking at um, whether there will be an impact on, on power lines, right? And whether there will be an impact on connectivity, because without electricity, we cannot connect to the devices, yeah, right. my son's been begging for that to happen. Just letting you know. So to what? To actually have a snow day, or to just like to not lose power, and he doesn't have like to actually have the snow day. Yes, because I told them, I told these kids when all of this was, you know, everything was starting to fall apart. I said, "Watch, you kids are never having a snow day again. You guys are learning from home, no matter what, for the rest of your lives." No, we plan for that. It's the issue with us here. So we bring kids in from sixty-seven different towns, right? So because we're 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 a, a school in a district of choice. And so we have to think that, you know, in, I don't know, the bar camps did, for example, right, might have a loss of power. And that means that either those students might not be able to access, but what about the teacher, right? If we say that we're going to be learning remotely and a teacher in their town, we have teachers that live in mass, yeah. right? They lose power over there. That means that those kids, right, have to learn asynchronously have to learn on their own, right? So there are all these other nuances that we have to think through and problem solve for. Yeah, I, I mean, you guys really have had to think of everything. I mean, even in my case, Michi, there's mm -hmm. times where my my son's teacher isn't going to be there right away. So there's mm -hmm. like a sub, so she just, and I didn't realize what was happening at first, but she'll just like leave work in an email that my son just clicks on the assignments and just kind of gets them done until the teacher gets there. You know, oh, wow. it's like things are just really, things are very different. Yeah, and they are very different. They feel, they sound, they look very different. And now we're starting to think through like what's going to happen post COVID. Well, once we get through all the vaccination and all, all that, you know, all those details, um, you know, we have to think about how do we regain what we've lost, right? In terms of learning, learning loss. And then how do we bring our kids in so that um, or, or perhaps there is some type of blended approach moving forward for, you know, the approach. Um, how do how do we work through that is, you know, the next level of work. Right. Um, so I guess because of the challenges that you're facing, you guys are just not going to go remote. You're going to stay the course as long as you possibly can. 
Absolutely. Um, we are, especially now that when we look at our numbers and the health director and I were having this conversation, um, you know, the numbers were in the red, right? Hartford and many others around us are in the red. However, the numbers in the district, the positivity rate is, is around 3%. And so it's a very, very different um, positivity rate. And so we're going to look to bring kids in as, as soon as we can. And um, you know, those conversations, we're beginning to start to think, you know, we're thinking about that, but we'll probably look to do that, you know, later on in January and probably start a phased in approach, um, with the, the younger grades. Mm. So I, I want to ask you this and maybe you don't know the answer yet, but a lot of folks of course are speculating like this with the vaccine here now in Connecticut, I know that uh, most of us, the general public will not be receiving this vaccine until probably early summer, you know, at the earliest. But will this be, do you think in your opinion, be a criteria of attending school again? Well, I know that like with immunizations, you know, we can't mandate um, there, there's, there are choices that parents, you know, and rights that parents have. Um, and so we're going to have to think through that. The same thing with staff, right. To mandate a vaccination. Um, I don't know that we, uh, we certainly can't do it as a, like, you know, from an employer stance. And so, um, outside of that, I know that, you know, when I think about the phase, who, who has access or will, you know, like what's the criteria or who comes first, right? To have access. When I think about public education, um, you know, I, it is an essential service. Not, of course, not as healthcare workers within the context of a pandemic, but my goodness, I would offer, we are are, are very close second to um, having access to the vaccine, um, right? And so that's advocacy. That's advocacy that we're going we're going to do so so that it is available to our to our staff. Then we have to think about, um, you know, I play it all in my head already, Jenny Boom Boom. I'm thinking, okay, so do we have it here in our schools so that we can make it, you know, as accessible as possible to those that want it? Do we have to think about when? Because if there's a side effect, that means that they might be out of school for a couple of days. And are we going to have enough substitutes to allow for that? Right. So all of these dominoes, um, mm. you know, begin to move. Mm. And I just wanted to let you know that me and Michi actually read an article the other day. I sent it to him because, you know, um, I, you know, he's very uh, worked up about the vaccine. And I mean, I think a lot of people are, you know, they're a little nervous about the vaccine. I mean, honestly, um, but, I, you know, there was a, an article that did come out that said, yes, your employer can fire you if you don't get this vaccine. Oh, well, DJ Nietzsche, I have not read that, but uh, I will. <laughs> Don't worry about it, Dr. Torres Rodriguez. I'll send it to you too. <laughs> know, that, know that we are we are working closely with our legal team. Uh, and, and this is why it's, it's funny because, you know, my some of my colleagues in this spring, were, they were saying, well, you know, the pandemic, you know, one year and it's going to be all over and the vaccine and then we're going to get back to normal. So one year disruption. I'm thinking one year disruption. No, 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 no. You know, we're, we're, we're in it for a little longer than that. And yeah. you know, I mean, because even after the vaccine comes, they said that we still have to social distance and wear masks because not everybody's going to have it right away. And yeah, so it's going to be, we're in this for the long haul. Yeah. Completely changed who, who we are. Right. And, and how we interact. And yeah, I fully agree. I mean, so what can we do here to help out? Because you you mentioned all the, ch the challenges that families are facing right now and students are facing with everything that's going on. How can we, as a, you know, a community help out with the Hartford Public Schools right now? So, you know, one is the reminder, reminder to our, our youth that we are here, right? So we, we miss them and um, we know it's hard and just oftentimes just a reminder to check in. Um, we want to help. We not only have the basic needs here, we have the food available. We have mental health supports available. We have counseling for students and their families through telehealth. All of those pieces we, we can support with at no cost. If there are other needs that the families have, food and clothing, and we can, we, you know, we have our partners that we can, you know, connect. We just need to know. We just need to know. So do we contact the school directly? I mean, there's a lot of families that are now facing challenges that they have never faced before. So these programs are new to these families. So how do they go about so getting It's involved? our Welcome Center, right? So Welcome Center is at 860-695-8400 or on our website, and we will take it from there. 
Um, every school has a family and community support provider, but we also have a hub at our, you know, at our central office, which is our welcome center, and we are connected to our our amazing partners. You know, I, I consider us in Hartford to be what I call asset rich to some degree when it comes to community partnerships. We just need to know. And I know that for some of our families, right, these are things, their needs are, are they, they tend to keep things close to their chest. Um, and, and we just want to be able to support um, our students. Yeah. I, and, you know, it's so hard to even think about these kids that rely on coming to school to get a meal. Um, and the fact that they're home now and not, you know, might not have enough food. It's just, that's a very scary and upsetting thought. It is, it is, it is, you know, that's what we lose sleep over and which is why, right? So today is Tuesday. That means that our a, our a Monday, Tuesday cohort is going home with, right? A bigger bag, if you will, of, of, of meals because of, you know, the pending snow. Um, and we want to make sure that they're set not through the week, but also through the weekend. Hmm. Wow. That's just, uh, I can't even imagine the challenges that you guys are facing there at Hartford Public Schools. I mean, that's just everything you've brought up during the time that we've spoken. You've brought up so many different things that you've had to think about during this. Um, what's the biggest lesson learned, do you think? Uh, uh, biggest lesson learned is, um, really, you know, it, 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 it is, it's not even a lesson. It is almost like a, you know, like a slap on the face. Um, so we knew inequity, right? Inequity meaning like some of our students just don't have access to the same, right? And they don't have access and opportunity to have their needs met. We knew that. Some of us knew that personally, right? Out of personal experience. And it just, it's, it feels so, and it is so raw now. And to think about designing programming now when it's so hard to connect and post COVID, right? The, the, the mitigation, the loss, the recovery that we're going to have to do, not only academically, but with regard to the social, the emotional, the mental health needs of our students, that's, that's the, the bigger lesson right now that we have to you know, reflect and act on. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's something that you just brought up, the mental health needs. I know that, you know, I've spoken to a lot of parents who said that their children are really, really struggling right now with depression. They're confused. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of anxiety surrounding the, these kids. I mean, it's awful. It is. Um, and, and when we think about who we serve, right? So um, many of our students live in, in high need communities and they already experience, right? challenges and traumas related to either some familial challenges and or community-based challenges. And so we overlay, right, COVID, the pandemic, and the impact that that is having on their learning, their ability or inability, right, to extend and socialize with their peers. Um, that's a lot going on for, you know, the eight-year-old mind, if you will, or, you know, the 12-year-old. And, and add to that the fact that 55% of our students are learning, um, you know, are, are Hispanic. And so 30% of our, 20% uh, of our students are learning a second language. So there, there's a lot, there, there are a lot of layers to um, what we have to address, which is why partnerships are so important for us because we know that we can't do it alone. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, well, give us the information for the Welcome Center one more time for families that are facing these challenges and need some help, somebody to talk to. Yes, 860-695-8400, our Welcome Center in, in multiple languages. We're